I'm Scott Allen Miller, and today I want to talk about an extra little thing because this is an important tool to have in your tool set when looking at information about Nicaragua, and it's some things that people don't really think about too often. We're going to talk about trust and verify and how to understand your sources uh, for information here in Nicaragua. This is really important, so we're not doing this as a daily, this is a tool set video that we're going to provide that it's timeless because this is definitely not going to be associated with any one event. We did have some information that came up and a lot of people are asking where the sources are even though we provided them and to verify the information because they don't know how. So let's talk about this because it's a super important thing when it comes to looking at or moving to or just being involved with Nicaragua. Okay, so we provided some information. What it was isn't really relevant. Well, you'll figure out what it is if you're watching all the videos. But what's really important is a number of people came and said, Scott, look, and we'll pretend that they do so with the best of intentions. Look, Scott, you're amazing. You provide this great information. I absolutely trust you, but I feel like I should verify it because you're the only person with some of this information. How am I supposed to know it's true? And this is what we call in the security world trust, but verify. Yeah, it's absolutely fine to just trust me, but you really should be taking this verification step. So I realize some of those people are like, we're kind of offending him or something. You're not like, absolutely not. I actually want you to have this mindset for two reasons. One, it's just good for you, right? Like from, from a purely altruistic standpoint, I don't want you doing something foolish. But on the second is that as someone who is honestly giving you real information, I actually don't want you blindly believing me. And the reason for that is that anyone who is giving you honest information like me is in a position where if you follow me blindly, you are susceptible to finding someone else who is charismatic and simply blindly following them. And then they can lead you astray and give you crazy information because you got into a habit or a mindset of simply trusting and not verifying or not thinking critically, right? It could be uh, that you're finding a secondary proof or that you are evaluating whether something makes sense, right? So for example, if we said that Nicaragua has established a new moon base uh, and they're moving a huge population there, uh, you could say, Simply, you don't need to go look in the news for that. You could use logic and say, wait, they don't have a star base to launch from. They don't have a population or an economy that could possibly support this. Clearly, that's not within the realm of possibility. You don't need to go very, right? Does that make sense? Okay. So, but I do want you guys doing verification because it will reinforce that I specifically am telling you correct information uh, and it will prevent other people from trivially misleading you by simply saying things. So great, great approach. Absolutely. But now understanding that that's a good approach and that it is something that you should be doing that I'm not in any way offended. I have absolutely no reason to expect my audience to trust me beyond the things that you can verify, right? I do bring a certain level of trust. And before we go into how things work in Nicaragua, I want to talk a little bit about that because a lot of people are missing this and some of you may not be aware and some of you may not be thinking through what this stuff means. But so not to <laughs> not to name drop myself, but I am the single highest profile non-Nicaraguan in the country. I am monitored, and this is open, I have been told, it is very obviously true, I am monitored, every video is watched by the police via the Immigration and Border Control Department. Everything we say on this show is monitored. And while I have a great degree of freedom of speech, I can talk about essentially anything that I should be talking about. I am not, unlike in the U.S., and this is where people have different views of what freedom of speech is, in the U.S., I would have nearly unlimited latitude to provide false information. In Nicaragua, I have not that privilege. I can make mistakes. That is absolutely okay. I can may have accidents. I can get my confused. I can get information wrong. But I cannot be sowing disinformation. That is absolutely not legal. And there are many ways that the government can deal with this should they detect me doing so. And given that they're monitoring my show, we can assume that at least at a high level, yeah, little things will sneak by for sure. But at a high level, they are aware of the content that's going out and they are aware that the trend is that I'm being truthful and giving real information. Now, anything that's opinion, like oh, this town is cooler than that town, they don't care about that stuff, right? They wanna know if I'm saying there is a new uh, law or there's a new this happening or whatever, 
they want to make sure that that is correct. They may not check every absolute little item, but they're definitely checking. We know they're checking, and I have definitely been sat down and had discussions where they've gone through my material and said, yep, that's okay, yep, that's okay, yep, that's okay. We're monitoring you. This is how, right? That's how it works. And also, it's important to understand, now this is something if you haven't lived in Nicaragua, it would probably not occur to you as an American growing up in the United States, the ability of the government to reach out and have a conversation with you is very low. I mean, if they really need to, of course they can. But finding you, knowing where you are, thats it's all very difficult. In Nicaragua, especially for someone doing a vlog, making the kind of content that I do, involved in the things that I am, the government can reach me within minutes. If I posted a video and it had misinformation, they are able to get a hold of me in a casual manner. I can get a text, I can get a phone call, I can get an email, all of that within minutes. There are so many departments that have my contact information. Now remember, I'm going through the residency process, so everything, my home address, my phone numbers, my emails, everything is disclosed. They have my picture, they can be like, wait, this is this guy, right? Yeah, we're calling this guy, yeah, send him a text, send him a WhatsApp and ask, tell him this information's wrong, tell him to take this down, like they could do that. They've never had to, never have they done that, but they have the ability to do so. So if there was misinformation on any scale coming on the channel, you can be with some degree of confidence sure that the government would at least let me know, hey, you got some misinformation. Can you uh, can you maybe clean that up a little bit? Right, and if they need to take drastic steps, they can. And I know people have this imagination of this like really, you know, onerous process of, oh, you've done something wrong, what's gonna happen? Well, it's, it's simple, right? You have a conversation, maybe you shouldn't do that. Eventually you have a conversation of, well, maybe your residency is not gonna get approved. Okay, but I can still stay indefinitely on a tourism visa, right? You don't need residency. Well, at some point that can be denied, right? That's always, there's always a very simple way to simply not approve you staying. And so if the government had a need to very casually move me out of the country and, and be like, nope, he's, he's sowing disinformation, the stuff is dishonest, we, we can't have this. They don't have to do anything drastic. They can very casually just encourage us to leave by slowly raising the temperature until it makes sense to move on. But more importantly to most of you, yes, it is important knowing that the government does watch my show, that they do keep tabs on things and that I am not allowed to just go wildly out of control, especially in topics that are important. But also we have thousands of episodes, all of which or nearly all of which are verifiable as being made in Nicaragua. Yes, once in a while I'm traveling and I have to make an episode while I'm somewhere. Sure, that happens. But the vast majority, literally over a thousand episodes have been made in Nicaragua. And at any given time, you can visibly verify that that is where I am. Or if you can't in, in a certain episode, people in Nicaragua definitely can. They know where I am from the shot. And so we're, we're, we have a uh, an amount of volume that you have a whole bunch of things about me that you don't know about other people. You know that I'm in the country. You know that I'm providing this content on a recurring basis. You know that for years the content has been accurate, including when I go out and dispute major news sources. Those are things that are verifiable time and time again. Yes, there have been mistakes. That is going to happen. As someone said, with the amount of hours of talking that Scott does, there's going to be mistakes. That is absolutely true but it's also insanely demonstrable that I've been providing fundamentally correct information and correcting misinformation time after time after time after time. And it is also demonstrable that there is a crowd of people who routinely provide verifiably false information, logically false information, over and over again, and you can check that, you can follow them, you can follow their comments, and you can also tell when I'm saying true things because they will come on and try to claim they're false because their job, for whatever reason, whether they're a troll or paid, are also to sow disinformation. But it's really easy to check and you can see that they're doing this over and over again. So while I am a random anonymous uh, third party living in Nicaragua, you do actually have uh, a reason to trust my content vastly above the majority of content you'll see from the country, whether it's online content, whether it's um, resources you hire in the country, right? There is no real estate company. There's no lawyer. There is no uh, accountant, none, not a single one that has even a smidgen of my verifiability for information, not one, not even close. Right, so that's, I mean, you talk about the people that everyone talks about, they'll be like, well, they'll drop names. 
Those are people that we don't even know for sure actually exist. That could be a made up person that just everyone got together and said, let's have this name and we're all gonna use it for misinformation. And then there's no one to actually take the fall, but everyone's looking for that, right? Like that's really easy to do. So <clears throat> it's very important. I am relatively unique in being so incredibly verifiable. And because I post every day with current content and show where I am, it makes a continuously increasing level of confidence that you can have in the material because it can be verified time after time after time that there's never been any intentional and never been any large scale misinformation. Yes, little accidents, of course. Okay, now we need to talk about how you would actually verify, right? Like, okay, all that's fine, but that is not verifying me. That's just meaning I'm a very well-trusted source. I am more trustworthy than a major news outlet, for example. I don't have access to the same things as a news outlet necessarily, but I do have a higher degree of confidence because you can verify that it's a single voice time after time after time. A newspaper, you could be like, well, the newspaper's good a lot of times, but they have a new author. Maybe they slip through an editor. I don't have that. This is all coming through me. So, yeah, in some cases I can be misled by someone, but I divulge my sources in most cases, like the topic we have here. Everyone who actually watched my video had everything they needed to go absolutely verify. No one was left without the source. I couldn't give you the source. I gave you the, the information of how to contact the source, right? Because that's how it works in Nicaragua. So that's the important thing here. How do you actually verify? So here in Nicaragua, and this really throws off North Americans because it couldn't be more different that basically no resources that you really need are available online. And what is available online is a bit different and misleading. So yes, a number of Nicaraguan laws are published publicly and you can go look them up. And a lot of people do this to me from time to time. They will, they will say, oh, the thing you said is wrong. And then they'll show me a law. Now, they don't know if that law is current. They don't know how to read that law. They're not a lawyer. It's not in their native language. In most cases, there's a lot of things that make those laws very difficult to read. And, you know, the famous one is someone tried to tell me that residency happened automatically and that you were taxed and like all these different things. And it's not at all what the law says in the way that we use the terms, right? Do you, be, you know, I'm not going to go into those details. We've done lots of videos explaining that. But even the information that is online in order to be useful must be read by a really well trusted, really experienced Nicaraguan lawyer who is aware with how the courts treat it. Now, it's not like the United States where the courts have a lot of latitude to just kind of make up the law as they go or read it any way they want. But there is a certain need to know exactly what a court is going to do with a given law. And that is true anywhere in the world. You cannot, and everyone does this, everyone who wants to try to dispute the information will say, well, some company in the United States who is under investigation for fraud, they claim this thing that they couldn't possibly actually be an authority on, right? And they'll use these extra, uh, uh, extraditional um, resources and try to say, ah, the, the lawyers in Nicaragua don't know, the, the judges in Nicaragua don't know, the government of Nicaragua doesn't know. What do you mean they don't know? This is a sovereign country, no one has any say in this whatsoever except for Nicaraguans. You cannot go to international resources and, and have them interpret the laws of Nicaragua and then apply it because, well, you know, some third party company hired an intern and he said, this is what the law means, right? So even, even when the law is published, you still need to have resources inside the country under normal circumstances to interpret that. You can get a lot of information by reading it. You need a lot of vibe of what the government is trying to do or what the lawmakers are trying to do, fine. But to actually know exactly how it's gonna be applied, you have to have a, a bigger scope. That is why lawyers exist. That is why they have to be certified and go to school for this and, and have special training and be, you know, tested because it's, complex. If, if they didn't have to do that, if, they didn't, if that wasn't necessary, if you could just read the law and, know, and that was it, you wouldn't need lawyers right? at all. It wouldn't be a career. So, so that's one piece. The second piece is that normal information in the country beyond those laws, essentially nothing is online. The idea that it's going to be online means it is just nonsensical in the Nicaraguan context. That's not how anything works. You can't reasonably go look up uh, the tax system. You can't go look up uh, incorporation paperwork. You can't go look up anything about the residency process. None of those things are published publicly, not in the least. There is no government website that has all this collected information, whether by department or centralized. There is nothing of the sort. So from a starting point, anything you've ever done for research on Nicaragua never involves actually checking with the government. It just doesn't work that way. There's no major resource that can be found that way. So whether you're going back six months, six years, or 30 years, there has never been a resource like this for any information. 
So that's not an option. I mean, it's great to go look for it. Let's just double check that the government hasn't put up an informational resource about this. Okay, as expected, no, right? I don't know of any situation where they've done that, except maybe during COVID, because there were so many people who needed to know so many things so quickly, they may have put up information pages at that time. Short of that, absolutely does not happen. There's no department to do this. There is no central website to have gone to to start with, right? The government at this time does not even have actual working email. There is no mechanism of centralization of data dissemination through, through traditional means. Everything is done by direct contact, internal memo, from the central government to the departmentos to the municipalities. It is all done internally within the government. If you want to know how something applies to you, you or your lawyer must go speak to an official who is official normally in person. Yeah, if you know them, you can WhatsApp them and just send them a note, that's fine. But you have to have direct contact. That is the singular method that is reliable for finding out about nearly anything. It doesn't matter what it is. Now, a lot of you are concerned with, and this came up with, the residency process. So let's talk about this. Nothing in the residency process, literally nothing, is available online. There is no information that you can find. Everything is either me telling you that I'm one of just a few uh, social media uh, content creators who have said anything about it. And if you go to anyone else, it is someone who is paid to tell you what you want to hear to try to get you to sign a contract for them to provide services for residency. And then you're just trusting that someone you have no idea who they are, you have no way to verify them, they have no track record with you, no way for you to actually trust them beyond just a random person, but you have to trust them even less than a random person because they have a major financial incentive to trick you into using them or to tell you what you want to hear so that you will sign up with them, right? And that's what people will do, right? They'll go and say, well, this person didn't tell me the thing that I wanted to hear, so that doesn't give me a lot of confidence that I'll get to do the thing I want to do. This person told me what I want to hear, so at least I can hold them accountable, in theory, I don't know how you're going to do that, for, for not providing me the path not being what they said. But all they have to do is say, well, it changed. I, well, how am I supposed to know? And you're on the hook, right? There's every incentive for them to tell you what you want to hear, and going to them and asking, going to a completely unverified resource to try to verify a verifiable one, and doing so uh, where you're uh, potentially incentivizing them to tell you anything you want to hear so that, that you work with them or you reference them or you advertise them as people did over and over and over again in the case that just came up, obviously is a dishonest process. Like that is how you, that just asking that person borders on being dishonest that the intent is to get a false answer or, you know, to get a hopeful answer, but not one that has any reason to be trusted. No reason to be trusted, but every reason not to be. They're starting from a suspect point, whereas no matter what you may think, you can watch my channel and I'm starting from a really high level of trust that you should have in me because I have verified so many times that I'm being honest, but you still should verify but you should start from a position of trust as opposed to a random person making money by telling you what you want to hear. They should start from a position of distrust. Absolutely let them earn your trust, but they have to earn it or you have to hedge or you have to simply take their information and say, okay, if you give me some information, okay, so you, you say this, how do I verify that? Because it goes against what a verifiable source has said already. So this is a surprise that you think he's wrong. Why? Right? No one's asking why because they don't want to know. Right? But they're asking me why, because they don't like the information that they got in this particular case. That's why it's coming up for verification. Not because I said something that they distrust being true in all, any case that I've noticed. It's always that they really don't like the answer. So instead of saying, oh, that's unfortunate. How do I work around it? Does it apply to me? Anything like that? They're saying, oh, we don't want to trust the source. I'm going to find a source that's going to tell me what I want to hear, which makes no sense logically, but emotionally, it's how human brain often works. Okay, so let's get down to this. In this particular case, residency, every step of residency goes through a different department. Again, none of it is public. Every piece is secret. So anyone who's got any information on residency, whether it's what the uh, investment limits are, how long you're going to get to do things, how you have to do renewals, uh, how border runs work, all of that information 
generally is very positive, so people don't question it. It's the easiest process in the world. It is so straightforward and simple and good, and everything about it is absolutely fantastic. So no one ever says, what's your source? Why do you think it's that way? And people realize that it's a thing that I and many people I know go through all the time. So like obviously, he's witnessing this firsthand, so it's an extremely reliable source. It's not just that you can trust me as a person to be telling you the right thing. You have an extreme degree of trust because you generally know that I am actively doing these things, so I have a visibility into this that essentially no one else has. Only the very, very tiny slice of us who are currently in the residency process would have the visibility that I have. So that gives me a credibility that if you called a lawyer, for example, could not have, because they live here, they don't go through the process, they don't have the same visibility. They have no direct contact with the moving parts. Theirs is at arm's length. Okay, so with the residency process, everything you know about it, is coming from sources like me, someone, third party, unofficial, posting online what we've learned about the process, either from firsthand or asking lawyers who may or may not be uh, sources themselves, uh, maybe having contact with government officials and finding out, hearsay. Of course, some of it is written in laws, but you have to piece it together and put together the pieces and hope that you understand the big scope to get an accurate picture. Uh, there's all these different pieces like that, right? So that's how you're finding out even that residency exists in Nicaragua. The very, literally, the very existence of the concept comes from this process. So questioning that process, while good, you have to understand that to get to the point where we're talking about that you don't trust, in this case, a minor detail about a very small piece of the residency process kind of requires you to ignore that every single piece up until then, including your expectation that this piece didn't exist, is all based on something less verifiable than the thing I'm saying. Now, if you want to verify any given piece, you have to figure out where that piece fits into the picture, right? So for example, if you want to apply for residency, do you need a lawyer? Well, the answer is no, but how do you find that out? Well, only by kicking off the process and trying to do it yourself. And eventually you run through it and sure you'll run into some problems, but you'll get through it if you put in the effort and know what you're doing to any degree. You'll get through it and you can verify, yes, I was able to do that without a lawyer. You can also say, would it have been easier with a lawyer? Probably, that's a good assessment, but you can definitely do it without. Save you some money, maybe save you some time, probably not. <laughs> you then directly contact Migracion, that is the Department of Immigration, and they will step you through a number of the processes. Hi, I'd like to apply. They're going to give you forms. They're going to tell you where to go. It's a very in-person process. Now, most of us work with a lawyer, so some of these steps we don't have to go through, right? Exactly what is Migracion going to do when you go and talk to them and say, okay, where do I go for, uh, for the next step? Mostly, they're going to tell you to go talk to a lawyer. They're not going to give you a lawyer, but they're going to say, look, this is really something you want a lawyer to do. There's people everywhere, Tramites, who uh, specialize in this, and this is, this is probably something you want. But here's the form. Have a good day. Right, that's, that's gonna be your starting point. And as you go through the process, there's just a number of steps you have to do. Some of it is assembling data. This doesn't actually involve a lot of interaction with Nicaragua. You have to go to your home country and gather some paperwork that Nicaragua is going to require. This will all be on the form. This is stuff that a lawyer will step you through very quickly. This is stuff that we can tell you about to some degree, but it is, it's just a level of paperwork. But keep in mind that at the last second, at any moment, it could change. Right, so just because it was true yesterday, just because it was true for me, doesn't mean it's gonna be true tomorrow. This is a constant moving thing, but knowing what to expect gives you a leg up. Remember, this is a process that sometimes involves showing up and having just more paperwork be required. Sometimes you have to do that. It doesn't cause any problems to anyone I've ever heard of, but it is something to be aware that you can't just predict that I have everything, it's done, there will not be any more questions. They can at any time, even while you're there, because this is not determined by law. This is a process done by departments, so any given department can make their own rules as they go, because each one is given a certain amount of autonomy to do their piece. Now, the whole thing broke down, yeah, that would be a problem, but in general, it's pretty straightforward. So a certain number of pieces, you can talk to your local Migracion office, and get information from them. They are a definitive source for you. If you need certain other information, the only place, because they're the only ones who actually approve your residency visa, is in Managua. So for very certain pieces, and I'm recording this as my wife is there picking up this paperwork right now, there are certain steps that must be done at Central Migracion in Managua. And that includes getting the final paperwork in order to uh, do your final submission. Right. Currently, it is only provided there. You have to go buy the paper. It's very cheap, but you have to buy the paperwork so they don't have people just running things off the printer for forever. And then you assemble your paperwork and put it in. But in the process to do that, 
And, and part of the problem is that's where you learn about certain pieces. But Migracion only knows certain pieces. Migracion is part of the police department, right? So they're police, but specializing in border control and migration. One of the requirements of residency is to have a health certificate, and that is given by the Department of Health. So in order to get that, you must go to your local clinic, your local public clinic, and this is determined by your address. In doing the residency process, you must have an address that you give to the government that says, this is my location, because they will do interviews. And so that address has to match a whole bunch of things in your paperwork. So you have to have a semi-stable address during this process. You don't have to have it before, you don't have to have it after, and you don't have to actually be there at all the time during this uh, process, but you do need to be able to be contacted there, and you have to be able to be uh, surprised there during the interview period, which is not a big deal, but it is something that people need to be aware of. So when you get to the point of doing the health check, it is simply a yes or no from the health department. You have to go to this local clinic, which is a hospital. You go and you tell them, you know, I'm doing this for residency. Often they're very confused. There's only a couple in the country that get any number of expats. So this is generally a confusing process for them. Uh, they will send you around to do blood tests, to do fecal exams, to do uh, potential uh, in-person exams. They can do anything they want. This changes from time to time. There are some central requirements that are pushed down uh, from the, the national government, but there are other requirements that they simply do at the clinic level. So this happens in, in multiple ways, and they have autonomy to do this. They are not part of the police. They're not part of Migracion. They are in no way part of the general process of visa or whatever. They are just the health department. This would be the equivalent, if you're from the United States, of the National Institute of Health, uh, and they simply issue something that says, ah, yeah, we've verified that this person is healthy enough or not healthy, right? It's it's more of just meeting requirements. You can be pretty sick and still pass through. Like, it's they, don't be worried. I've never heard of someone actually being denied through this process. It's just they want to know certain things and make sure you've been checked and, and, and given some information or something. I'm sure someone could be denied. I've just never heard of it, and I have no idea what would cause that. But I know that you know, major health issues, never been a problem. Lots of people are retired coming in. Obviously, they come in, in most cases with lots of health issues. It's just the nature of being at retirement age. So not a problem, right? Don't, don't be worried about that. But in going to do that, what tests are required, what different vaccines are required, anything like that is determined at that time. There's no one else you can ask. The police certainly don't know. Migracion, as part of the police, has absolutely no visibility into this unless they're personally friends with someone with the information in the hospital and they bother to ask what the requirements are for people that are not Nicaraguans. It doesn't apply to them. That Why would they care? They would not have that information. So unless you have a police officer that you happen to ask who happens to be friends with someone who just did it and found out like earlier that day, they would have no access to that information. Right? They may know who to call if you said, look, I got a buddy in the police. It's random that he's in the police. He happens to know someone in the hospital. Could you call them and ask? Yeah, that could be a process. But fundamentally, your only way to get firsthand knowledge, if you do that thing, you're, you're in the same boat as asking me because I have direct information from the authorities. Right, So if you're going to trust someone to call and relay the right information, you might as well trust me because I'm at least verifiable. Now, if you, someone's your personal friend, obviously, it's a little bit, a little bit more verifiable. But that's, that's what you're looking at. That's where you're trying to uh, get to. So if you want to know what are the absolute definite requirements for the Migracion component, you have to go to the police, specifically in the immigration department to Migracion, and ask them. That information will be definitive. Now, if you think someone's made a mistake, you can go to their boss, you can work your way up the chain, potentially, if you have enough clout, and verify from a higher and higher source until you get to the top that something is true. Yes. Even in the case of the law, a lawyer may not know. The police officer on the ground may get it wrong. Sometimes you have to work up. And at some point, you get high enough that it doesn't matter what the law is written as. This is the person who's making the determination as to how it is interpreted. Right. So that's, there is a point where you can basically call it authoritative. In the case of your medical exam, that is the director of the hospital. You go to the hospital, you can ask a nurse, they give you information. You say, well, I, I think the nurse may have this wrong or this is really surprising, which is what happened to us in this particular case. We then went to the doctors. They basically confirmed with the nurses, but were a little bit hesitant about, wait, that doesn't sound completely right. Something is wrong with that. And they went their way up until they got to the director, which is the absolute final word for health services. And they said, nope, yeah, the nurses had it almost right, but there is this detail they got wrong. Absolutely. This is a requirement. It is a national requirement. And that is how we got the information in this case. Now, if you want to verify that, it should be really obvious that the only possible verification beyond having a friend who calls and does this for you, 
or trusting me or other people like me, that you are confident have gone and done this verification currently, there is no other possible source. You can't ask someone for a link. There is no such thing. You can't ask a lawyer. There's no reason for them to know, right? You can't just ask random people. The only authoritative source is the director of health services. You need to talk to them directly. That is the process in Nicaragua. And I realize a lot of people are like, but how am I supposed to do that from abroad? The answer is you're not supposed to do that from abroad. That is not how Nicaragua works. Nicaragua has no mandate to provide information and resources to people who aren't here. If they did that, they would have um, a real problem, right? Because the number of people who aren't in Nicaragua vastly outnumbers the number of people who are in Nicaragua. The number of people who are considering Nicaragua, who are just casually looking, have some passing interest, is in the hundreds of millions. But the number of people who will seriously come to Nicaragua, who will actually get on a plane, come down, put in time, and really consider staying long-term, whether as residents or as long-term tourists or whatever, it's relatively small. It's in the thousands. So when you're talking about Nicaragua providing resources, doing that to the massive world of people who may use up national resources in order to ask questions is, is a real problem, right? They, that would cost a lot of money. It would waste all kinds of time. But if you limit it to people who are actually putting in the effort to come to the country, have decided that they want to at least seriously consider living here, they're willing to go spend their own time, walk to the, to the hospital, wait in line, ask, get the information they need firsthand. Well, that's going to limit it to basically no one, right? The number of people who would do this ahead of time, maybe five or 10 in the whole country in a given year. So this doesn't use any number of resources. People won't even remember that it's happened and it's spread out all over the country. So it's, it's not impacting that many people. So they, they need to protect these processes and they just don't have the, the means to make public announcements. They don't have a means to have a website with all this information on it. They just don't have those resources. And even the news articles that have a lot of things, we have to screenshot them because they have so many news items that come up. This is not the kind of thing that hits the news because it's not, not affecting Nicaraguans, but things that affect Nicaraguans, when the government makes an announcement, it goes up and it's often only up for a few hours because they always uh, use, they use Instagram and they only keep the current news announcement on the page. And so if you want to have it as a reference, you have to take a screenshot of it Otherwise, it gets replaced with the next item whenever that comes up. So that's a challenge that we have, that there isn't a good, easy to access permanent repository of information. But it does mean that what we're seeing is always current. We don't get tempted to see old information that hasn't been taken down that may no longer be relevant. So there are benefits to it. Um, a traditional newspaper, quite often people will send me things and say, look what happened. And you'll be like, wait, wait, this is a 10-year-old article. This already, this is way resolved. It was already disproven, whatever. Oh, oh, but this, so that there are benefits to this process, but there's negatives as well. Long-term linkability is just not a thing. People don't use websites in Nicaragua across the board. And most everyone works from phones, not computers, which really encourages using social media rather than traditional websites in a lot of ways. Nicaragua would be well served, I believe, to move heavily towards a more advanced web and email infrastructure like much of the world. But that is not something that they're on the cusp of doing it is a major lift. It would require a lot of education at every level uh, to get both the people prepared to be able to work with that, to understand how it works because they're not used to it, and to get the government and other agencies and businesses to put in the effort to create that infrastructure. As it is, Facebook and things are so completely free that everyone just relies on that because free is a big deal here and it's what people are used to using. So there's no incentive to be a, a pioneer in moving people off to something that is often seen as being very old. Some companies have websites, of course, that's very few and far between, and mostly it's catering to expats or to the extremely affluent. So if you want this information of nearly anything in the country, this is just one example of something that people do want to really be able to verify, and you can, and I in every instance have provided how you would do so, you have to put in the effort to do so. If you really want it verified, otherwise you're stuck. You have to trust me because there's nothing else you can do. And that's unfortunate, but there is a way to verify, and no one has even made the wild claim that they bothered to try to verify uh, and, and do anything, right? Some people have made a claim that they went to a completely unofficial source who has zero reason to have any expectation would possibly know and claim without him being willing to put his name on it that the information uh, was incorrect. That's obviously, obviously, 
designed because they knew the information was almost certainly correct. And so they were trying to come up with a way that seemed plausible to discredit it, because if they had actually access to the country, if any of those people were actually here, actually knew anything about Nicaragua, they would know that the only way to verify is this. Now, for most of you, you don't know this because you don't live here. Those who live here know automatically, oh, yeah, calling a lawyer could not possibly give you good results. How would they know? There's only one way you have to ask the officials. So it's unfortunate that that's how complex it is, but it's also good that people tend to get direct personal contact and direct information and someone they can ask about things. But it's really important to understand. This is stuff that we talk about all the time when people are saying, well, but I want to look at real estate from abroad. Yes, that's great, but there is no MLS here. There's no government-based centralization of tax records, of purchase records, of, of prices, of market value, of valuations. None of that exists. Not online, not secretly. It doesn't exist. And that throws people off. And they feel like, but these real estate companies, they put up websites that say things. Yes, but it's not based on reality. Maybe it's their best guess. That's plausible but it is at best a guess. But in reality, most of the time, it's verifiable that the sites have absolutely, obviously fake information in, in the majority of cases. So that there's information online. Yeah, sure. Someone is always going to put something online to grab your attention and hopefully get your money. And people will tell you what they want you, what you want to hear or what they think you want to hear, because that's how you get people to be like, oh, you're my friend. Thank you for giving me this information that Scott wasn't willing to tell me. If I'm giving you information that makes you unhappy with the channel, chances are I'm going out on a limb to expose something that you're not going to like, but you need to know. Now, going out on a limb to tell you guys the things you don't want to hear but are true about the country or about processes or what you need to do or whatever is not something that does me any good. I get uh, very nasty comments. I get really upset viewers. Often people are upset with the messenger and that's the nature of things. Sometimes people think that somehow I'm creating the situation or something and I get actual threats against me and my family. That's a real thing that happens uh, when I bring this kind of information in some cases, in this one in particular, and, and, and through other channels, not through uh, YouTube. And it doesn't really help me in any way. If I was doing this purely for my own purposes, I would either just not bring that information to you at all. It's easy for me to ignore. There's no reason for me to really go out on a limb to provide stuff you don't want to hear. Why bother, right, other than trying to do the right thing and provide that information? If I just was silent and let you be surprised later, well, I could pretend I didn't know or most people would never question whether or not I knew. You'd have no way to know, know if I had known or not, or I believed it wasn't going to apply to you or whatever. Even if I was called out on it, it'd be easy to, to whisk away, right? To just wave my arms and say, well, how would I, how did I know that was going to apply to you too, right? <clears throat> and I could point to all the people who claim it's not true and be like, look, I verified with all these, these people have verified, right? It's very easy for me to not take that responsibility. And it would also be easy for me to simply tell you what you want to hear. And then when it's not that case, go, oh, things must have changed. How was I to know that they weren't going to change at some point? Of course, that's a possibility. So I have a lot of incentive to not bring this information. And most of that incentive comes from my audience. I don't get the backlash. I don't get the loss of viewership when I give you what you want to hear. When I'm just doing a walk in a neighborhood, I'm just doing completely happy stuff, telling you how cheap it is, how affordable it is, all of that completely positive feedback. But if I expose something that you may need to be warned about, or you may need to adjust some consideration or just be aware may impact you possibly. The backlash is typically pretty strong. This one was stronger than most, uh, but just the fact that that is what happens, that it is negative for me, negative for my channel, negative for my family and my mental well-being, and I'm willing to go through that to assist those people who honestly want good information should also provide you a little bit of additional verification. But absolutely, I totally support trust and verify, but I don't support coming up with obviously fake uh, reports secondhand from a person who's unofficial and said, so, well, they don't know about like, no, you have to actually verify and you cannot expect that this one piece, whatever it is we're talking about, right? In this case, it's one thing, but it could be anything. You cannot come and say, well, why is this not on a government website? Nothing else was on a government website, right? So in the case that we have here, nothing said what the requirements were before, Nothing said that this wasn't a requirement, and there's nothing that says now that it is a requirement. There's no resource for anything of the sort, 
but no one has ever asked before for any verification for any of the information we've had all along. No one asked for the verification of the opposite of this. Only in this one unique instance, suddenly a verification is being requested in a manner that doesn't exist. For everything always, the only verification step that has ever existed is to contact the facility and talk your way up the chain and talk to the director and get a definitive answer. That has been the sole source of information and the sole verification of information since day one. But people are treating information they don't like completely differently. So watch out for that. Watch out for it in yourself that you're suddenly trying to make barriers to information that you wouldn't do if it was information that you liked. You're not treating information equally. Is it likely? Is there reason to, to believe that this particular thing is true? Yes. So let's let's talk about you have this. How do you actually verify with the authority? So now you know that is the process and that applies to everything. So treat everything equally if you need to, right? If it's something you don't care about, well, I don't care if that's true or not. Well, then you don't have to verify it, right? But if it's something you care about and you really feel you need a verification and you really feel for some reason that you can't trust me in that particular instance, absolutely do the right process, right? And, and accept that that is what the process is. And I know it's onerous. I know it's a huge amount of effort, but that's to some degree intentional. The other though is to apply logic. Right. So for some things, for example, we have a lot of people who like to claim that the Nicaragua Canal is moving forward, even though all news outlets that are reliable in any way whatsoever, all have agreed that for more than a decade, completely off the table, there is no such thing as a possibility of a future Nicaraguan canal. That is universally known by all official, all reliable, all legit resources. A lot of scam resources trying to make a quick buck or getting paid to do something nefarious or just trying to get views like to stir up trouble and claim that a Nicaragua canal is coming. But of course, if you don't trust the news outlets, which is reasonable, a lot of media outlets are not very trustworthy, so it can be difficult to know who to trust. With the Nicaragua canal, it's a great example of where logic could have been applied 15 years ago to say, oh, a canal in Nicaragua is not viable. There's no way that even with a good engineering study, you're going to come up with a way to make that work. And even if you did, it would have been marginal, which everyone always knew. And if Panama built a canal before it, it would take it off the table completely. All of those things are true, right? We know that it was never viable. It was never a good idea. Even if Panama didn't build another canal, Panama did build another canal. It totally took it off the table. All funding, all legal backing, all talk of the canal evaporated just like that, as was always known it was going to, should that happen, and as was generally known was going to happen no matter what, because it didn't logically make sense. It just There's no reasonable way to do that engineering effort. So you don't have to actually know if the Nicaragua Canal has a history, if it's a thing that was ever proposed that anyone was ever looking into it. Just using logic and looking at the situation, you can reasonably guarantee that no, of course there's not going to be a Nicaragua Canal. It makes absolutely no sense. There's no way to make that work. It is a crazy idea. So that's another thing you can apply. So in this particular case where we're dealing with, yes, it's a, it's a vaccine and part of the, the residency requirements, you can, if you are willing to actually step back and say, does this make sense, at least to some degree? Does Nicaragua have suddenly their own vaccine that basically costs them nothing to give out? Oh, yes, that's a sudden trigger. So there's a reason why this may have just started in the last few weeks, and those news articles are out there. So some of the news is public, just not the residency requirement portion, because that's not news, right? That's just a very under the hood, quiet, no one cares requirement. So that there's suddenly a vaccine available, that it's free, that it's available to all people, tourists and otherwise, all of that is super, super public and obvious. So that there could be a moment where suddenly there's a ton of vaccines and they're willing to push them in certain segments absolutely exists. Would they do it with expats going through residency? Oh, yes, that's a potential trigger because it is the only group that they are able to do it with. You can't force citizens to get a vaccine. That's not ever going to happen in Nicaragua. They don't do that stuff. Now, they'll try to convince them to. They'll make it as easy and free as possible. They'll try to educate them on that. They'll, they'll maybe put some social pressure. Oh, you should really, really think about doing this. But they'll never force you. That is not how Nicaragua works. They never force people. It's not the United States. It's not Canada, right? And even they really basically never do that. They uh, definitely can't do it with tourists. 
How would you do it with tourists? You can't, you can't. It doesn't make any sense. There's no possible way to do it with tourists. It wouldn't physically function. So you don't have to worry about that. So it is a unique situation where you have people who want to go for a completely optional residency, because that's another thing. Use your logic. Okay, the residency process is completely optional, even for people who are leaving here, living here permanently. There's ways to do it without becoming a resident, and most most of the expats who stay here permanently aren't residents and don't want to be. So this is a very optional thing, even within that subset of people. So making it a requirement in a very unique spot where they can make it a requirement and it basically impacts no one and those that it impacts is extremely minor, right? Either you're okay getting the vaccine and you just get it, no problem, or you're unwilling to get the vaccine or just really dislike it and then you just don't go for residency and stay under the other regime, under the, the permanent tourist visa. Yes, some people then try to make that sound like it's onerous, but those of us who live here, most of us find it easier. I do know some of you live in places where that's not true, that's a separate thing, but in general, it is easier for the majority of expats. So this is a tiny sliver of people, and it is a group that they absolutely can force to do it because no one's forced even to live here to go through that process. So there's all this logic that says, ah, there's a reason why in time this is happening, there's a reason why it's this process that's doing it, there's a reason why it's limited to these people, um, and that it matches Nicaragua's overall drive for healthcare while forcing nothing on anyone, even the expats. So, oh yeah, logically, this is completely viable. I don't know that logic would say this is what would happen, but logic definitely says that this is within a complete realm of reason, both in time and in events. So we have lots of tools to use to verify this. Every time you see someone complain about it and get really upset, they normally post something combined with it that isn't true to make it sound like it's implausible, right? Oh, they're forcing people to do this. Nope, no one's forced. Where did that come from? We've been so adamant that it's not forced. Right. And then people say, well, why aren't they doing it to the population? Wouldn't they do that to the no, if you think about it? No, they absolutely would not do it to the population because that goes against everything. And it's the polar opposite of what they're doing. Right. This is an optional process in this case. And so we can do this with almost anything. Right. We can do it with the canal. We can do it with vaccines. You can do it with other things. Would this make sense? OK, so we have a really reliable source that says this is true. Logic says this could be true. There's no reason to doubt it. Uh, we have everything comes together. Do I want to go through the effort of flying down or driving out, finding the right resource, waiting in line, and verifying this myself in person? Would you do that with any normal information? No, people don't. People don't go to definitive sources and put in that effort very often. But if that's something that you're questioning and it really matters to you, absolutely that's something you need to do. Now, it'd be great if I had sibling uh, YouTubers who had the same resources and time and and drive and were like, okay, great. So Scott found this out. I'm going to go through this whole process and the same thing. And and you would have a, a double verification, right? And and maybe sometimes they would come up with, oh, you know, the person you talked to was, it's a departmental thing and it's not national. There's all kinds of opportunities there, but we don't have those resources, right? There isn't another verifiable large uh, foreign YouTube channel like this or, or other social media resource that isn't selling you something that you can go to uh, to get information. That just doesn't exist. In a larger market, it would, but we're limited here. There's just a lot of these things don't exist. So you're stuck with the only other resources are people who aren't actually foreigners. They may have grown up other places, but they actually have ties to Nicaragua. So not, there's nothing wrong with that, of course but they don't have the same experiences as an expat or as a, a person going through residency, but they don't have to do that, All right? So, that, so they just have a different set of information about some of these processes. Um, of other people, uh, channels have disappeared. Uh, a lot of channels have disappeared recently. Um, people have just given up. Uh, Jack Pittman really, uh, uh, sad emotional plea about how discouraging he found having a channel. And and I can tell you that this past week has felt uh, very much, I, I have an affinity for the, what he's been going through and how he feels about his channel and why he gave up on it because um, it's certainly an absolutely tiny, tiny subset of the community who's very angry that I'm bringing the news, that I'm that I'm telling the truth, that I'm exposing things that they don't want to hear. They're not upset uh, with me completely, but they're taking it out on me and they're lashing out 
And there's a number of people who aren't really part of the community who, who just show up because they see the content and they use it as a chance to attack and threaten and stuff. And that's common and I know that's gonna happen. Um, and that's, that's not really discouraging. That's a sign of a successful channel and a sign that you're telling the truth, right? If you're telling the truth about things you don't wanna hear, you're going to get backlash. So that's good, but we have a really strong core community and 99.9% of you guys are absolutely fantastic, even when it's news you don't want to hear, when it's stuff you don't agree with, right? And, and we're not out here promoting what this is. We're simply explaining why it works the way it does, how to verify it, and what the rules are, what you're going to have to deal with. In fact, it's because it's kind of a negative. You know, I'm a bit more pro-vaccine than most people uh, that have responded, definitely not more than most people. Uh, but I'm perfectly, you know, was I going to go out and get the vaccine on my own? No. But was I like worried about it when it was a requirement? Also, no, like it was fine. But that puts me into a group that was willing to go out and get that sudden, but it was still interrupted my morning. I had to suddenly drop everything I was doing, squeeze in between meetings, run to the hospital, wait in a line for an hour, talk to people, get the shot, very painful shot. Well, I mean, it's a shot, like they only get so bad, but it's definitely the, the most painful vaccine I've ever had. Nothing compared to the mRNAs that I had in the United States. Those basically I didn't feel, kind of. This was like, ah, oh, right? But maybe it's just where they hit me with a needle. I don't know. But it's not something I wanted to do. It's not how I wanted to spend my morning. I didn't want to have to make these videos, although I do appreciate how popular they are. But uh, that's the process. That's the thing. And that's the background, right? So, so please understand that this is very hard for me to take the effort and to put up with the backlash to bring real information. Um, and, and I appreciate all the people who watch the show and say, wow, yeah, years generally correct. Yep, mistakes, some people point it out, right? Yeah, the mistakes are gonna happen, but I really am verifiably putting in a massive amount of effort to bring you correct information and a lot of information, information that no one else is willing to bring to you because the people who generally have this information are either so disconnected from you guys, like there's just no way to connect you, and why would they want to bring you information? Because if they say anything that they don't, that people don't like, people get angry with them, as if it's their somehow their fault. So they're strongly discouraged from exposing that information. So the only people who have any incentive to actually provide you any information are people who are financially incentivized to not necessarily give you correct information, but to simply tell you anything it takes to get you to sign up with them and hand over your money. And then when you find out things are not as you had hoped, it's too late, you've already paid, and what are you going to do about it? Right, that those those are the choices. Um, so uh, I I really want you guys to understand um, the effort that I'm putting into this. But this isn't about me. I really do want you guys to do whatever you can to verify, think critically, question, and understand how to actually get real answers, and when possible, certainly do so. Thanks for joining me. Uh, this is a special episode um, that uh, I think we're going to link quite a lot because anytime people have questions, and and please keep this in your tool set of when you're like, how do I find out about these things in Nicaragua? It's, it's both important to know where to go, but also important to know where not to go. If you just go searching online, you're almost certainly going to be misled because people are encouraged to put up websites with potentially false information, more likely just lazy and old information because it gets hits and maybe it brings in traffic and gets them customers or whatever. So there's a lot of incentive to put up really friendly information that just drives you to their page. Uh, and then there's no one to stand behind it. I have to be on here talking to you guys every day. If I put up misinformation, people are going to call me on it. And even when I put up real information, people are going to call me on it. Uh, but if I'm routinely putting out misinformation, that's going to be really, really obvious. And so I encourage you to go back and watch old episodes uh, because I stand by every episode we have. Is there once in a while mistakes made? Absolutely. But I completely stand by. No episode has ever been taken down. We don't delete comments unless it's uh, attacking other people or doing something illegal. Bodily threats are generally not allowed. Uh, YouTube does filter, but I really do not. I have not gone out and deleted a comment and I can't tell you how long. Um, and uh, yeah, do your due diligence for sure. And no, I am not offended when people question and check, but you have to be willing to do so honestly, to do so in a real way. You can't just you can't just question me and then be like throw it at me. Well, the government has pro hasn't provided a resource that I agree with as being definitive in a way that I'm okay with being told, so I'm not going to believe a really really well verified source. That's that's not an okay response. You can question it. You can say how would I check this? 
I'm happy to tell you, I did voluntarily. No one had to ask me for that. It was given from the very beginning. I explained why my source was authenticated and how you would authenticate if you needed to do so as well. So yes question, but be realistic about it and either accept that this is the information you have access to, it's the most accurate that we can get, or be willing to put in the effort to go verify it yourself. And in which case, great. That's something that would do a lot for us, but also be prepared that if you don't go and take a camera and show it happening and do it, no one's going to believe you either, right? It's going to become the same thing. It'll, it'll verify it for you, but it won't verify for anyone else. That's a problem that we have, right? Because people are like, well, where is your source? I went to the source, but the source doesn't want to be on camera, right? Which it's a government official. So that's just not something you can reasonably do under normal circumstances. Now, this is such a big thing. Maybe I can convince someone to come on and do an interview and uh, that would be great. But that's a really long shot to convince someone who has no interest in doing this and no reason to want to be on the show and no reason for this information to be something they care that people get. There's no incentive for Nicaragua to tell people about this, because if you get to the point where you're going to go through the process, what do they care if you decide to cancel at that point? It doesn't hurt them at all. So they're they're not incentivized to put in a lot of effort to preparing you for this because they expect you to either go through the process and just do it without question or to not go through the residency process. Totally up to you, but it's no skin off of their nose either way.